outside the moment it disappeared. There's no shock because you already looked at the temperature before you walked out. If you didn't do that, then they're here for shock, and sometimes you can't get to the It's either one. I mean, we're just we're running off of the ambient sound. For the people in the room, it's probably better to use a microphone of yes. some kind. I'm gonna use this one because I don't trust myself on the case of the way. She'll be ready in a moment. <laughs> so uh, I'm very happy to introduce Nicole James. Um, who is now teaching in the chemistry department at Green College. Um, she is an Oregon native. Uh, she comes from Yamhill, um, first generation college student. And like all college students, wants to leave town, kind of see the bigger world. So Nicole went to Quinton uh, and got to experience Eastern Washington, um, which I guess expanded your horizons a little bit. Um, so following um, a chemistry major there, Nicole went to University of Chicago, where um, she studied physical chemistry. Um, she actually entered a physics lab to do her degree in physical chemistry, and I think it's a really great story, um, which happily she shared with us when she interviewed me, because she didn't share, she's not going to share it with you, I can, but um, she was working in a lab that did non-Newtonian uh, fluids, like, the, what's the Ubeck, right? Where it just punched and breaks your fist, as one of her colleagues did. Uh, in video, by the way, it's kind of cool. And then it, you can just softly push your hand through it. And so um, Nicole had the hubris, the whatever, the confidence that chemistry had something to say about this. The physicist doubted it, but um, actually, it does turn out that new molecular forces have a lot to say about why a fluid would behave that way. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, while at Chicago, Nicole developed a really strong interest in pedagogy. Um, she was very active in the graduate school with the TA and much further than um, anyone would expect a student uh, to do in investing yourself in really thinking about um, undergraduate education. And uh, upon getting her PhD, moved to the University of Northern Illinois, where she was the inaugural diversity and human and equity postdoctoral scholar. And it's kind of a, it's a shocking story when you really all of a sudden think of it in itself that this is a department that had an intro chemistry course, as many universities do, where a large number of students were getting Ds and Fs. And you think, how is that possibly acceptable that students are taking this class and not taking away anything from it? So um, Nicole's brief was to get them to pass. And uh, <laughs> she will probably talk to me about that after. No, it's all new things now. So, <laughs> Yeah, but of course they're error marks, so they be worked out. Um, and I think one of the great things is, um, I, I hope I'm not offending anybody when I've had chem ed people tell me um, that those people who are really great pedagogical researchers are not necessarily the best teachers. But I think uh, Nicole is very happy with a want to be an excellent researcher and an excellent instructor. And I'm really excited to hear what you have to tell us today, because apparently it's all new things. <laughs> Very new. It's not often I feel like you get to get introduced by somebody who's interviewed you twice. So that's very, <laughs> that's very thorough. Thank you, Arthur. Um, hello, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, there are so many students here. I don't get nervous for teaching, but for some reason, I'm very nervous for this. Um, but I'm excited to tell you the story about uh, a, a literature review that I'm doing with students who are present in the room. Uh, that we started since I came to read. So this is very new. Some of the things I'm going to show you, we did yesterday. So, uh, here we go. Uh, the idea about deficit and deficit framing is kind of come to the question of when you have a bunch of students and they do something, they take a class or they take a test or whatever, um, sometimes you get striations between the outcomes for those students. And so this is really honing in on 
Um, so I want to start by uh, acknowledging some of the people who were involved in actually doing this work. Um, so this is my lab from last summer. Here did a senior thesis with me. He's also here. It's a surprise. But the students who worked on this project are Josie, Henry, and Karina. Josie, Henry, Karina. Um, and they did a lot of uh, what I'm about to tell you. And I, I want to say that a lot of this work came from an idea where I was like, why don't we have a paper that does this? We need a paper that does this. But I never thought that I would be the person to be involved in writing the paper that does this. And I wouldn't be if it weren't for these students and their interest in the topic. So it's very, um, I want to be sure to give a lot of credit to uh, the student contributors to this work. Um, and I want to start by uh, sharing with you, if, this, if these terms are new to you, these terms of deficit framing or anti-deficit framing, I want to show you a little bit about how it's being talked about in the literature recently. Um, so, 2020 paper says, a deficit perspective infers that students are unsuccessful because of their own intellectual or academic deficiencies. Who they are is not good enough. Uh, another recent paper says that a deficit thinking model views achievement, achievement gaps as the primary problem rather than a symptom of the problem. So to give you a couple concrete examples, right? You, if you're teaching a class, right, there might be some deficit that you have perceived. So some students maybe aren't turning in their work. And you might think uh, some students just aren't trying and they don't care about your class. Uh, and if that's what you think, some actions that you take in response might be to get reminders, to emphasize how important it is, to emphasize how they're never going to be successful ever if they don't learn stoichiometry. Uh, but an alternate approach, right? If instead you think something, you assume the students want to submit the work, right? And something is preventing them from being able to do so, then and your reactions might be different, right? You might shift deadlines. Maybe you give a poll and you discover, oh, actually, all of my students are in this lab class that, you know, tends to go long the night before my early morning class has this assignment due, right? So students don't have as much time to work on this as I thought after we had got all the material. So then maybe that motivates you to, to shift the deadlines a little bit to uh, ensure students have time to complete all their work or do something like that in response to making sure students have more access. Um, this approach, right, is something that we would say is maybe a deficit-framed approach. Um, and what I mean by that is that we're trying to fix the individual level, so we're assuming these deficits lie in the individual, and that we can fix the deficits by fixing the person. This approach over here, in contrast, is saying these individuals are functioning in a system to the best of their ability. We can change the system, right, and that will help the outcomes and address the deficits that we're observing. So this is one example from a teaching perspective. Um, and often these come in very language-focused terms. And so I want to give you another example just to emphasize how the approach here really does inform the actions taken, like I just showed you, but also as education researchers, the knowledge that we generate from our studies. So if you come in as an education researcher with a research question of why do minoritized students persistently score lower on assessments, you will get different results than if you ask the question, what aspects of the assessments are implicitly uh, selecting against minoritized student populations, right? These are sort of two sides to sort of the same central issue, right? You've identified some issue with this assessment. Um, but this one is perhaps deficit frame. It's assuming that the issue is lying in the minoritized students. And um, then that's going to motivate you to center the examination of those individuals in however you design your study, the methods. Um, versus, oops, sorry, uh, the results that you get from those methods, right? These tend to do things like identify correlations, right? To say students from this particular racial group tend to score this way, right? And that then also tends to uh, make people say things in papers uh, like the effect of race, right? When really what's happening is you're, you're seeing an effect from possibly racist structures in the society. Uh, this question here, right, is a more anti-deficit framed research question. The methods are going to more likely center examination of the assessments themselves, right? Um, and so those results might surface some weaknesses or biases inherent in the test that weren't known before. Um, so this is a sort of fix the individual approach. How can we make every individual person successful in this exam? And this is sort of a 
well, is there something wrong with the exam? And I'm not trying to suggest that there's something wrong with every single exam, but if you only ask questions like this, you'll never know if any of the exams need to be fixed or not. Um, so this is, an, I, this is the idea that I want to set up about um, depths and antidepths of framing and how it impacts both classroom practice and also research structures. Um, and the sort of guiding motivation behind this is the idea that education should be inclusive and equitable. I'm not going to try to convince you of this, I'm just going to take this as given. Uh, and what I'm going to try to show you is that deficit framing can undermine that and that this is something that's, that's often very unfamiliar to STEM instructors. This might be new terminology to many of you in this room. Uh, it's not often discussed in the science education literature. Um, when it is discussed, I've given you two example uh, definitions, and they were a little bit different, and maybe had different implications. So the definition of these are not necessarily clear. Every so often they'll come up also conflated with this other term called asset framing, and the similarities or differences to and from asset framing are also not very clear. Um, and this is a topic that has been highly studied, just not necessarily in the context of science education, more in the context of education departments that look at education broadly. Um, and so the goal in this project is to summarize some of this existing scholarship around these ideas that has been done in these other departments and then translate it to a STEM audience. So this motivates us in this project to formulate these particular research questions. So the questions we have are, what are the characteristics and attributes of how education research defines deficit, anti-deficit, and asset frames? Um, in what ways do those frames, uh, uh, do the teaching approaches using those frames differentially impact students from majoritized or marginalized backgrounds? And what attributes of them, of the anti-deficit and asset framing, can be employed in higher education to promote student success? So the way that we're going to approach answering these questions is through something called a systematic literature review. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about how this works because it's something that we don't often necessarily see in the context of chemistry. It's a little bit more common in biology or medicine. Um, but the way this works is to uh, establish specific methods for how you're doing your literature search. So we often tend to see narrative literature searches where you read a bunch of things and then you summarize them. Uh, but that can often be very organically done. Here what we do is we start by identifying search terms and databases. We apply all of our search terms to all the databases, and we get everything, every single hit we take. And then we go through all of them and we say, I have these particular inclusion criteria, which of these papers satisfy my inclusion criteria, and then you get all the ones that make it through that pass, and then you develop exclusion criteria, and then you filter out of that pot, and then eventually you have a data set that you do synthesis or analysis of. So I want to walk you through why this is so helpful in this particular context, and also how much time goes into doing something like this. So one big advantage of this is that it's much more exhaustive, right? Um, you're really trying to structure things to capture anything possibly uh, relevant to the research question, so that you're not missing things just because they haven't maybe been cited or they haven't been published in the most prestigious journals. Um, you're, you're trying to get any information available out there. Um, it makes your methods transparent and reproducible, right? So that there's actually a way to answer. If there was a paper that is relevant that you didn't find it, why didn't you find it? Maybe because it was published as a proceedings and not as a published article, but that is clear and there's a documentation trail um, of why things get included or excluded. Um, and these things work together with the goal, right, of reducing bias of what publications you're paying attention to and what publications you're not. Um, yes, so. To show you this briefly, uh, Kava, Josie, and Henry and I worked together to uh, identify search terms in, in databases. That's time consuming in and of itself, right? I'm going to sort of cut to the chase there um, and say that these are our final search terms. So, you know, anti deficit, deficit, deficit framing, and some combinations of those in the context of education, as you might, as you might suspect when you talk about deficits, you also get a lot of unrelated uh, economics type papers. Um, so, this is an effort to whittle that down a little bit. Um, and we apply them to all of these databases. When we do that, we get 5,010 studies. So, the question then becomes how do you possibly wrangle 5,010 articles? So we pull them all, and by me, I mean they, <laughs> uh, pull them all into a program, and I'll show you in a minute, and it will automatically remove duplicates 
thought this was going to fix all of our problems. I was like, surely all these journals that all these journal databases that we're using are giving us lots of the same papers over and over again. And I thought our number would collapse quite nicely as soon as the, the software that we were using uh, excluded the duplicates. And it could have been better. <laughs> uh, so that left us with just over 4,000 studies. Uh, this is also good though, right? Because it means that our goal was to cast a wide net. And we really are casting a wide net. And we really did need to look at all those databases um, to get this. But it also means that we still have to deal with 4,000 studies. So what we do now is we apply our inclusion criteria. I'll tell you a little bit more about these in a second. Um, that uh, excluded um, for about 4,000 studies again. So we apply inclusion criteria. The ones that make it through the inclusion criteria are these 142. So now we're getting somewhere that's actually manageable, right? Now you apply exclusion criteria. That takes out 113 studies, and you're left with 29, which is quite nice. Um, I want to emphasize that this is all done in the software program. I also want to emphasize, right, that this is a summer of work that is really laborious and tedious and done not at all by me and all by the three undergrads working on the project. And so they deserve a lot, I think, of respect of their stamina and persistence in this work. Um, this was organized for us by uh, a, piece of, a piece of software that gives one encouraging message. The first time you review your first uh, uh, citation, it shows you this image. <laughs> <laughs> as a little emotional boost of uh, what is to come. Uh, so I'm going to share with you these inclusion criteria to sort of, uh, make this overview a little bit more concrete. So the way we got from 4,289 to 114 is our inclusion studies. We said um, that in order to be included in our data set, uh, the article needed to be a peer-reviewed journal article written in English. Right? So this is part of the way that it produces bias. It makes you very aware of the sometimes implicit assumptions you're making, the fact that we need to be able to read the language that the article is written in. Um, and there might be articles relevant to the thing that are not written in English that we are necessarily going to miss. Right? Um, also, the findings or conclusions of the article need to contri directly contribute to the understanding of deficit, anti-deficit, or asset-based paradigms. And, and this is important, that must be made obvious while reading the title or the abstract. Because we're going to read about 4,000 titles and abstracts, but we're not going to read about 4,000 full texts. Um, so so this, is, this makes sure that we're getting stuff that is like substantively about these ideas. They're not mentioning them just in passing. Um, and then the third criteria is that they're discussed in the educational context, and then also that's obvious while reading the title or abstract. Um, so these criteria in and of themselves, developing them is also a process, right? So we drafted these based on our research questions and what made it feasible to do, but then we also had to do some trial and error and tweaking of these to make sure that the, that the uh, research team was applying them consistently. Um, so every single abstract was also screened by two researchers, and if there were any that were disagreed between that, then we met and discussed it um, to try to make sure that, uh, that we're not missing anything. Um, which is easy to do when you're sitting at a computer all day looking at titles and abstracts and titles and abstracts. The next step here is then to take these and develop our exclusion criteria. So sometimes it does not become obvious until you're actually digging into it that this doesn't really look like a peer reviewed journal article. Um, so that becomes an exclusion criteria if we notice at that point that, oh, this didn't meet actually that inclusion criteria from before. Um, sometimes also you have abstracts that really do make the paper look like it is substantively about these ideas, but once you really dig into it, it's something that they mentioned at the beginning, and then it sort of tailors off, right? So we have this coming up again where you sort of have the, the, the parallel to our inclusion criteria, that we exclude stuff because it is not directly contributing to the understanding of these ideas. Um, and then also this point of, if it doesn't contain a definition, or at least a description of these paradigms, it's not gonna help us establish a definition or understanding of what they mean. Um, and so if they're using these terms, but they're never defining them or explaining them to the audience, then that would be grounds for exclusion. Um, and so, again, we go through these, we develop these, uh, we, we do what's called an iteratively consensus coding to establish that we're, we're using them similarly, and again, every single article is coded by, is screened by two researchers, and we discuss any disagreements. Um, this exclusion criteria was the grounds to exclude 21 of these studies. This one excluded 64, and then the next one excluded 28. So this is the sort of like standard methods for how you show the transparency of the process that gets you to this final data set. And so now we're here. 
and we have 29 included studies, I'm going to give you just like a, a little sense of, of what ends up in this pot. We have a combination of theoretical and experimental studies. We didn't put year limits on, but we, we found mostly pretty recent articles are the only ones that are really meeting our criteria. Um, our oldest articles are from 2001. We have articles that were, were, were published you know, the same year that we were doing this, this work. What we're going to do with them now is analyze them according to this approach called concept analysis. So we're going to adapt it a little bit. The idea of concept analysis um, also comes from the medicine literature. Um, it says you're going to start by identifying all uses of a concept. Oops, apologies. Identify the finding attributes of the concept, any illustrative cases, if you can construct a model case, borderline and contrary cases, and then antecedents are things that, uh, that come before, that cause um, this, this idea or concept to happen, um, and any consequences of it. So what we're going to do, and then define, sorry, define empirical references. What we're going to do is use this as a framework for how we are reading and understanding the information contained in these articles. Um, so I'm going to uh, walk you through this um, as we go. First thing we do is we, if there's a definition in the paper, we capture that. And we say, I'm going to put this on a list of possible def uh, definitions. Uh, so that's a level of extracting data from the source, right? So that you're not just dealing with 29 PDFs, you're dealing now with a list of information that you've extracted from that data source. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of these examples. It's very common in a lot of these papers. I'm showing you a quote from uh, one of our older papers that's actually quoting a book. So Valencia 1997 isn't in our data set, uh, in our data set because it wasn't a peer reviewed journal article, it was a book. But it's really heavily cited in a lot of our journal articles that says the deficit thinking paradigm causes that students who fail in school do so because of alleged internal deficiencies, um, such as cognitive motiva uh, motivational limitations or shortcomings such as familial deficits and dysfunctions. Popular at-risk constructs now entrenched in educational circles views poor and working class children and their families, typically of color, as predominantly responsible for school failure. Another quote that we saw coming up around this time uh, were the pervasive assumption that when students misbehave or achieve poorly, they must be fixed because the problem is inherent in the students or their families, not the social ecology of the school grade or classroom. Or deficit frame exists whereby students of color who are culturally different from their white counterparts are viewed as culturally deprived or disadvantaged. So what we're seeing here is already some differences from the descriptions I showed you in the more recent literature. And because of this, right, so before I was basically just like, is the problem in the individual or the system? There wasn't this component of race that we're seeing emerge in the earlier studies uh, around this uh, concept. Um, and so when you have this really central emergence of race, it becomes especially important for the research team to model uh, reflexivity. So Kana and Henry and Josie uh, all worked on the stuff up to this point, but the data analysis actually um, happened following the end of the summer, which was done by uh, Henry and Josie. And I don't know if you've guessed yet, but I'm very white. Um, so there is an important uh, component of being aware of that and being aware of how it influences your interpretations of the data. Um, and reflexivity is a very good tool for this. So generally the premise is right that the researcher's position is going to influence their analysis. Um, and sometimes this is very clear, right? What's going to occur to me or stand out to me from something like a paper is going to depend on my experiences, my biases, how I've been socialized maybe, and a lot of other things. Um, Particularly in what we call qualitative work like this, but this I would argue is true in, in all science, right? Even if you're doing very um, like cut and dry scientific measurements, you still run something in the lab and maybe it works one day and doesn't work the next day, and maybe depending on how you're feeling, you're like, I don't think I really need to look into why it didn't work this day because I think maybe the temperature was up or something like that. And so then you just take the data point that works, right? Stuff like that happens very frequently um, if you're not really interrogating any sort of assumptions or biases you're making. Um, and this becomes especially important in this type of work. Um, so what that motivates us to do, right, is really consciously reflect on how our position in this process uh, affects the work that we're seeing, right? So one of the things that, a lot of that is just like trying to make really explicit any assumptions you're making, trying to be very, very conscious of am I 
discounting some parts of their story because they don't resonate with me because my personal experiences are different? Um, am I paying equal weight to all the things the authors are emphasizing in and of themselves? Am I really grounding my interpretations in the data sources that I can see? One way in this study that you'll see me trying to demonstrate this is by leaning really hard on directly quoting the authors themselves. A lot of these authors are people of color, and so I lean hard on using their words to represent their interpretations because I don't share those backgrounds, and so I won't be able to communicate the same way. So, diving in then to this idea of deficit frame. We're using that concept analysis structure to do what we call coding the data. Coding the data is a level of abstraction. So you're looking at something in the data, a quote right here, and you're interpreting it in some way. And I'm going to try to, for almost every single code I show you, I'm going to give you a direct quote from the data to demonstrate um, what we're interpreting under that. So antecedents, things that you see in the papers that are tied with deficit frames being used in practice, particularly in schools. Um, include this idea of assuming that default behaviors are the behaviors you usually see in white people, or this whiteness is default idea. Um, and, and one illustrated quote of that is, teachers often use the behaviors of white students as the norm by which to compare black students. This particular study focused on the of black students, but we see these general ideas pop up in, in multiple articles. Another idea, a lot of these are going to be interrelated, is this idea of racial or cultural stereotypes. Um, so another paper by the same author, this author is very quotable, they so tend to say things very concisely, uh, so you'll see their name a lot. Uh, the less we know about each other, the more we make up, right? Um, oops. So this relates to this idea of whiteness as a default, because now when you're seeing something that isn't white, right, you're making, you're uh, having stereotypes to describe what that is, in contrary to the sort of accepted default. One of those things that comes up a lot is this idea of low parental involvement. Um, and this, be this becomes very important because, as you'll see in an illustrated example that I give you soon, um, there's a lot of racial or cultural stereotypes about parents that impact students' educational opportunities because teachers often prefer to work with students, especially in the K-12 system, uh, whose parents are more involved in schools, right? And there's this sort of default expectation that clearly everybody is able to do that and wants to. Um, another thing that comes up very frequently in a lot of the studies is this idea of multicultural incompetence, that most teachers are ill-prepared to work with culturally, ethically, and linguistically diverse students. Consequently, they misunderstand cultural differences, and educators may perceive these differences as deficits. So this idea that you are a teacher who ended up in a classroom, and you've always existed in spaces where whiteness was default, and so maybe there are some stereotypes that are, are leading you to misunderstand other. Um, these things also feed into a reliance on biased test scores. Um, so there's a lot of history behind this, um, and I chose to cut down this quote, I struggled with this decision a lot. Um, but there, around the time of people trying to develop intelligence tests, there was a lot of implicit assumptions and lack of research or reflexivity that led to tests that reinforced pre-existing biases of who would be successful. Um, and a lot of these tests ended up mostly measuring not intelligence as they meant to measure, but familiarity with American culture and English proficiency. Um, another quote by the same author in her paper says, uh, intelligence tests are effective at identifying middle class white students as gifted, but it can ignore those students who perform poorly on paper and pencil tasks conducted in an artificial setting or do not perform well on culturally loaded tests or just have styles different from white students. So this is the idea that your test is measuring something, but it's, it's maybe not capturing all the ways that intelligence manifests, and it's maybe privileging some behaviors that are maybe more common in white students over other behaviors that are maybe more common in other cultures. So these are, these are not all of the antecedents we're seeing, but they're, they're five of the main ones, and they, they come up as interrelated in a lot of the other antecedents that we see. Um, Defining attributes is this other condition. Antecedents and defining attributes are very interrelated. A lot of the antecedents we see persist during a deficit framing uh, context. Um, and so you'll see that uh, you'll see that reflected also in these. Um, but it's very clear, especially in the earlier studies in this area, 
that deficit frames are really tightly connected with this idea of teachers believing that the students have poor home environments. So for example, uh, the reasons for racial disparities in student achievement boil down to poor parenting and or cultural deficiencies. This, is, uh, this paper is saying that this is what teachers are believing. Uh, that the unsupported, uncaring, or undereducated parents and their limited or non-student English spoken at home creates poverty and chaotic home environments and a lack of a value for education, and that that's what gives cause to these perceived deficits. Um, working alongside this is this intrinsic acceptance to the status quo. We see this um, referenced very frequently in a lot of papers. Um, this idea that uh, we have just been conditioned to think that some students are just not going to do well, not going to do as well as other students. Um, this idea that teachers can teach well and care deeply, but they can't necessarily fix kids, families, or communities. That these things, this sort of assumption that these things are going to happen, these things are going to make it impossible for the students to succeed, there's nothing you can do about it, that's just the way it is, that's the way it's always been, that's the idea of the status quo. This also manifests in sort of essentially blaming the victim. I have quotation marks here because I have literally what we've called, what we call in vivo coded this from the paper. Um, so that's language that they use whenever you see uh, a code category here that's in quotation marks. That means that I have used that language directly from the paper. Again, to try to make sure that I'm being um, uh, authentic to the things with itself. So explanations for poor test performance of black students the, uh, say that the fault rests within the student, um, so the student is just cognitively inferior or culturally deprived. This leads into if there's any way to fix the situation, and maybe there's not, right? Maybe it's impossible for the teachers to fix this thing. But if there is a way to fix it, right, it's by fixing the student. But the student should adhere to what we've decided are the right values and priorities, um, and this is the key to the academic and uh, economic success. So this is very different than the recent papers that I told you in the beginning. The recent papers were sort of this idea of like, is it maybe fixing the student, maybe fixing the person, uh, or the system? Um, but we're seeing here that there's a very different initial origin from a lot of these ideas. Um, and a lot of these papers talk at length about the role of white supremacy that you're seeing really in a lot of these things. That um, the, the way right, that I want you to think about white supremacy in this, in this context is this idea that you are privileging white structures over other structures, right? You're creating a hierarchy. Um, and that, uh, you know, this comes up with this idea that the judgments about cultural practices and values that don't line up with white or middle class norms are inferior, right? And that they lead to deficits. Um, and we see that here, right, in who gets to pick the right values and priorities who gets to set the status quo, and who gets to decide what is a good versus poor home environment. So these are some of our defining attributes. And now, I want to give you the, some, some like, concrete examples of where this um, manifests. Things might feel a little bit abstract at this point. Um, but for example, Stories about the extent, so this is, uh, in, this, in this particular article, this person is recounting um, teacher talk, right? So teachers sharing stories about the extended trips that some Mexican immigrant families take to Mexico and the number of school days that their children miss as a result. And the storytellers would often remind their listeners that these families cannot really afford such trips, and that their time, effort, and money would be better spent helping their children learn English don't they get that their kids are already way behind and that they wonder why their kids are failing? So hopefully, my, my goal, if I've, if I've constructed my talk well, is that you're seeing some of these echoes of um, cultural misunderstandings, um, some status quo assumptions, some uh, judgment of family members, and some uh, instances of uh, blaming the home environment for the perceived deficits that teachers are seeing in their classrooms through this illustrated example. Another example from the same paper, uh, according to this veteran teacher, Darnell, a good, bright, uh, a bright, good-natured African-American fifth grader should be allowed to sleep in class because school was supposedly the only place he could get any sleep. The story told of Darnell's welfare-dependent mother and the chaotic home in which they lived, Darnell coming to school in the same clothes two or three days in a row, and showed, in short, this teacher's story function as an explanation for why any effort to engage Darnell in class was a waste of 
So some racial stereotypes coming into play. These are illustrated cases, right, of, of some of the individual codes that I've explained to you and the relationships between them, right, how they're functioning, is that they're asserting a white culture status quo, they're using racial and cultural stereotypes to blame the student or the home environment for the deficits in behavior or academic performance. So this results in some consequences to the students themselves, right? Um, a lot of the papers that we see talk about the, the lowered expectations for students from these groups as a result, right? So that teachers will express sympathy and caring for students while providing a kind of reality check that explains why less demanding schoolwork and lowered expectations is a kind and humane way to treat kids like that. Um, or that students thought the poor academic performance of students was inevitable, right? That's not anyone's fault. Students then come to internalize right, a lot of these deficits. Many highly capable black students question their own abilities and then sabotage their own achievement. Um, a lot of this results in uh, what one viewer refers to as uh, deliberate underachievement. I'm quoting them exactly as underachieved deliberately. Um, these students may also succumb to negative pressures to avoid achievement, particularly from their peers, and they come this is coming back to that white steps co component. They come to associate or equate academic achievement with acting white. So at that point, right, students are incentivized to underachieve because to achieve is in some way to leave part of their identity behind. Gifted African American students may underachieve deliberately and refuse placement in gifted programs, even when offered. A lot of this also results in a lack of teacher advocacy. This paper in particular focuses a lot on the reduced rates of African American students being placed into gifted programs. They identify that a lot of what gets you placed into a gifted program is teacher advocacy, and that these things all function to reduce the amount of teacher, the amount of advocacy your teachers are likely to, to do on your behalf. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot of this results in reduced performance. There are some consequences to people beyond just the students. Right? The students are receiving most of these consequences. Um, but one thing that comes up a lot, right, is that what, what a lot of this is doing is it's locating the responsibility for this deficit outside of the bounds of the classroom. So uh, a quote from another uh, paper that we read makes the teacher a, uh, this process of deficit rating, makes the teacher a mere referral agent and locates responsibility for student achievement beyond the teacher's reach. Um, a judgment that these parents do not value education, that they do not have their own children's best interests at heart, and therefore cannot be held, the teachers cannot be held responsible when these kids do poorly in school. This is essentially an abdication of responsibility over the results. Um, additionally, it alienates parents, right? We already saw that, that parental involvement was a factor in this, and so now we have like a positive feedback cycle, right? Um, where Parents are uninvolved, so you get a deficit frame, and the deficit frame further alienates the parents because, in this case, black parents view schools with suspicion and doubt, educators' commitment to diverse children. Such parents are unlikely to involve themselves in the school setting because of the belief that they are not valued as a resource or a member of the community. So to summarize, um, deficit framing, we're seeing this in um, our NSC that's shows that it's being caused by, and we have some interactions here that, that mean that it's also reinforced by, an assertion of white culture and norms, the existence of racial or cultural stereotypes, low parental involvement, multicultural incompetence on the part of the teacher, um, and reliance on biased scores. A lot of these things are very um, informal, but the reliance on biased tests serves to provide like a quantitative measure that reinforces them in a lot of ways. Um, like I said, these interact greatly, like the causes and reinforcements are also like very um, inter uh, interrelated with our characterizations or our least defining attributes. Um, but it really comes up with this acceptance of the status quo, which is in many ways, not necessarily intentionally, but um, comes from white supremacist origins, that this idea that, that whiteness is better and that the cultures and norms associated with white people are inherently better. Um, creates this perception of a uh, poor home environment, right, and cultural uh, deficiencies. Um, results in the expectation that the way to solve this is to fix the student, right, or blame the victim. 
to students, right, this results in poor performance. Um, and that can manifest in lowered expectations of students, right, reduced uh, teacher effort or advocacy, students internalizing their own deficits, uh, deliberately underachieving to avoid acting white, alienating parents from removing responsibility for the teachers in the home environment to improve student performance. So, I want to pause for a second here and take, uh, take a page from the software programs book that we used and give you a slight emotional boost. <laughs> <laughs> that this is very heavy, uh, and I congratulate you all on thinking about these things despite the fact that they are very heavy and that might not have been what you knew you were signing up for when you decided to come to a talk at 7.45 p.m. on a Thursday, but things are going to start to look a little bit more hopeful. Um, so if we turn to looking at this idea of the anti-deficit frame, uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster now since I hope that you're somewhat comfortable with this idea of, of what a code is and what I mean by the antecedents and things like that. Um, the anti-deficit frame, right, is characterized by teachers being very critically self-reflective. Um, it's helped me to examine how I had internalized some of the racial and cultural orthodoxies, how these stories have influenced my teaching practices and interactions, and how this practice can operate below the radar. Educators must engage in critical self-examination that explores their attitudes and perceptions concerning cultural diversity and the influence of these attitudes and perceptions of minority students' achievement. A lot of these follow naturally, right, from the fact that this is sort of the opposite side of the deficit frame. Uh, one component, right, of the deficit frame was that cultural incompetence, so a component of the anti deficit frame is cultural competence. Um, that educators are most responsive to diverse students when they are competent in the student's culture. They can learn how to infuse multicultural perspectives into the curriculum and instruction. Um, they become more literate in the testing and assessment, right? So this comes back to that idea of this reliance on the biased tests, being uh, more aware, right, of what your tests are actually measuring. So formal preparation in testing and assessment was seen as an antecedent that creates more anti-deficit framed classroom contexts. Um, this idea that in order to interpret the scores meaningfully, teachers must understand how culturally loaded tests can hinder minority students' test scores. Um, these things work together also um, to challenge the status quo, but confronting the status quo is in itself a vulnerable position. That title is on my, on my bed. That is not in uh, uh, our article. That's not the author's fault. Apologies. Um, the idea here, right, is that if you're just a teacher in a classroom, a lot of these things, a lot of these status quo things, um, are very difficult for you to challenge. Uh, you might not have access to challenging them in all cases. Um, and it can help to have external structures, right, that incentivize that as well, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Um, publicly available data is one of those things that helps empower you to challenge uh, status quo, right? So if you have data about how students are performing in the class and that is publicly available, then teachers or parents could bring that data to the superintendent and be like, why is this happening, right? And that is a motivating factor to sort of question some of the things that have just been accepted in the school. Um, these go hand in hand, um, the ability to stand to, to challenge the status quo, and then also the accountability for doing so. So a lot of things like the example that I just gave, right, parents are playing part of this role. Um, in some of the papers that we see, uh, external requirements such as state requirements, right, what these often do is empower people to challenge the status quo in a way where they're not spending their own social capital with their peers for doing so. You have this sort of like deniability of like the state says we have to fix this. I'm not trying to ruin your day, but we have to fix this. That makes it a little bit easier to push back on some of those entrenched cultural norms. So, antecedents. Um, defining attributes, right? Again, these are really closely connected. So this idea of multicultural competence, that manifests both in how the teachers treat the students, but also in what is taught. So the curriculum providing genuine options for all students to understand themselves and diverse cultures, this idea that students should be able to both see themselves in the course material and also see others. Sometimes you see this talked about as that every course should have both windows and mirrors. Um, that instructors could recognize that intelligence is multifaceted, right? So acknowledging that intelligence is complex and current tests are often too simplistic or, uh, to do it complete justice. So under starting to question that cultural norm of just accepting the, the tests, right, that may not be measuring intelligence, but may more be, be measuring something like English language ability. 
that incentivizes you to use more multi-dimensional assessments. Right? So this is one example of what that might mean. Educators understand that nonverbal tasks give students opportunities to demonstrate their intelligence without confounding influence of differential language or vocabulary. Um, and one thing that's highly implicated in all of this right, is quality teacher training. And the word quality in this code is doing a great deal of work. Um, because you know these papers talk about how the teachers require formal preparation and testing and assessment to understand these implications. You can have training and testing and assessment that doesn't challenge the status quo, and then that's not necessarily going to help in this case. Um, but this comes from an, an angle of wanting to help, you know, especially in this particular case, they looked at beginning teachers or novice teachers develop a genuine multicultural te teaching practice that recognizes, honors, and builds upon students' individual and cultural assets. Um, implicated in a lot of these is this idea of transparency. Both the transparency of what's happening in the classroom, this idea of the public available data and things like that, but also transparency to students, just of the expectations for them, um, are seen in a lot of examples. So those are our defining attributes. Consequences to students are pretty positive, right? So you get improved performance, you get improved retention, you get reduced equity gaps. Um, experience, I'm going to give you two quotes rather than watching for each of these individually that are sort of like looking at improved performance as a, as a general category. So idea that experienced academic success with students, this was teachers who um, had shifted to a more anti-deficit framed uh, uh, structure in their entire school district, experienced academic success with students for whom they had not previously thought it was possible. And year after year they pushed expectations and goals higher and higher. Um, and brought their districts much, much closer to the democratic ideal that all of us hold dear, truly high and equitable academic success for literally all children. So if I were to recap anti-deficit frame the same way that I did um, before being for deficit frame, it's really caused or reinforced by this, this ability to critically self-reflect and develop multicultural competence to understand right, what the assessments are telling you and to have the ability and accountability to challenge the status quo, um, to recognize that intelligence is multifaceted, to assess it in alignment with that, to have the training to be able to do that, and to have transparency of what's being done um, and what is expected of the students, um, which generally is good. Uh, what I want to highlight here, right, is that a lot of this was a surprise to us, or at least a surprise to me when we started this project, that those first quotes that I gave you in the education uh, literature had very little to do with race, right? Um, and that's what, in my experience, has been the common parlance around us at an end of framing in the education research literature. Um, but what we're seeing is I'm showing you some of the, um, some of the core components of what I've told you here today for the deficit framing, multicultural incompetence, reliance on bias test scores, this home environment, this whiteness as default component, um, and the anti-deficit, right, ones in contrast. But those examples that I gave you before that were just focused on fixing the student or fixing the system, those ignored some of these, right? They focused more on this idea of like, sure, there's the fixing the student mentality, right? That, that, that comes with this blaming the victim, maybe accepting a status quo of how the system is structured. Um, and this could still, you know, incentivize those students to, to do these things. This is, you know, uh, that translates regardless of the racial context that's at play here. Similarly for these things, right? Um, those are coming up in either case, but what we're seeing here is a sort of time striation. People who are talking about this more recently tend to talk about it only in these concepts, in these contexts. People who started talking about it originally talked about it in these terms. So we're seeing two forms of deficit and anti-deficit uh, paradigms. One that's really heavily grounded in unique circumstances experienced by marginalized groups, particularly racially marginalized groups and also a form that's very abstracted from race and culture, and often used to scale and generalize. Even some of the papers that we read um, from you know, as early as 2006 also do this. They'll talk about how sort of a flip side of shifting from a deficit to an anti-deficit frame is in some ways then deficit framing the teachers, right? Um, for how they're functioning. Um, and then that motivates people to look at the system serving the teachers in terms of their training and things like that. So, it is, I think, a useful um, conceptual tool, right, to think about this generally as it affects people and as we expect things of people and see deficits of people to be able to pivot and say, 
you know, what of this is the fault of the person or the individual, and what of this is the fault of the system or structure that that person is operating in. But I think it's really important to also note that a lot of this work was developed because of very unique circumstances that were coming up because of race, and to be able to hold both of those um, at the same time and not forget this because we are doing this. So, in summary, uh, my students looked through a lot of papers to get us to this point. Um, and what I'm trying to share with you is this idea that the deficit frame accepts white culture as a status quo, quote, racial and cultural uh, stereotypes, bias tests, uses those to sort of blame students in the home environment for their performance. And my deficit challenges that, right? Really embraces multi uh, culturally competent teaching and assessment to improve uh, performance and retention and that we're seeing these manifest in two types of different contexts. One that's very racially uh, grounded, um, and one that is much more abstract and generalized. And I wish I had, had, I had, I, I wish I had thought to put an otter photo on this summary slide for you, but instead, I'm just gonna remind, remind you about my lovely students who, through their persistence and hard work, um, allowed us to discover most of these things, many of which were brand new to me, and I thought I was coming in as a person who knew a lot about deficit framing when I started this project. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions if we still have time. Arthur hasn't scowled at me yet, so. Oh, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm here to be mean and challenge you. Do the same thing, except replace race with able and disabled. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. in my experience, if I were to have a PhD in one other Special ed programs are almost exclusively in your deficit model. Mm -hmm. Even when I was working on a teacher credential, the school approach, the educators' approach to the whole issue was severely deficit framed. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be good to see a really explicit way like now. Because it, uh, personal experience will tell you tells me that problems with the lack of inclusion for people with disabilities of any sort get worse as one progresses through the educational system. Mm -hmm. For sure. Absolutely. I don't think that's me. That seems very reasonable of you to say. The uh, well, challenge to do more work is me. <laughs> well, it, it, I think it's a challenge to do more work for the education uh, community as a whole, right? Because the, the papers that I've shown you here, they're really grounded in Almost all the papers do also acknowledge that while this might, in their particular context, seem to be manifesting and functioning mostly for race, that it has parallels to, particularly for socioeconomically disadvantaged, comes up a lot, but also disabilities comes up a lot in this context. One of the authors that I've been pretty hard on quoting here for you, Ford, who uh, had two of her papers in 2001 and 2003, was a professor of special education. Um, and so those themes do come up, but they weren't the focus of the theory building or the um, uh, or the experimental work that looked at how these things are functioning, but I do, I, I do think that the authors also talk about how you know the the marginalization is very intersectional, um, and it doesn't only apply to race. It can be generalized in some ways, but uh, it can be generalized and applied to different contexts. Um, but I, I think it's uh, I think it's very common. Uh, for us to forget sometimes when the origins of these useful terms that we are now using to help us understand and explain other things came from race. Yes? And then here and then over here. Uh, I just want to ask, in your inclusion and exclusion, there wasn't any mention of uh, the level of education, whether it was elementary, high school, college, if so. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't exclude based on level of education. We didn't, say, we didn't choose to only look at higher ed or anything like that. So a lot of the papers that we're seeing are casual. Okay. Yes? How have you tried to um, like implement an anti-deficit uh, anti thing right, fair 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 fair. in your own teaching, um, especially in intro form? Yeah, so uh, in intro chem, right, I, I think a lot about the fact that uh, students often come in, in, in into introductory chemistry uh, from a wide variety of paths, right? So 
you know, students, especially if they take intro chemistry for a general distribution requirement, they also take it because they want to be a chemistry major, they also take it because they want to be a biology major, and so being sensitive, right, to all of the different perspectives that students are bringing into the course and trying to make sure that all those perspectives are reflected either in the course material that I'm presenting or that I'm building in opportunities for students to use that prior knowledge as an asset in the course. So if you ask questions, like, they can sometimes be as simple as, like, explain an instance where you have seen this in your life. Um, and then that sort of knowledge, which might be disciplinary from your different discipline or might be cultural from your personal culture, um, is now relevant and an asset in the class. I also think a lot about you know, math skills and not necessarily assuming that students come with particular math skills because that is going to be varied um, depending on their, their prior experiences and making sure that we, uh, we create opportunities for students to learn the math that they need along the way trying to, to decrease instances of things like test anxiety, because it's a, a particular introductory chem is a context where you get lots of test anxiety that will also function in all these lines. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's some ways. There are more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you I wanted to ask about the, um, the challenging status quo part. Um, so, especially I can just like read where there's a lot of student educator contact and collaboration. I feel like there's almost a space not just for educators to try to change this, but for students to try to um, have their own, to try to challenge the status quo as well. And you discussed a little about some of the strategies that educators can use, and perhaps referencing state and laws to, or state regulations to offset um, make it possible deniability. But what are some of the equivalent strategies for students to consider? Yeah, I think there's a lot. The two that, um, that that come to my mind initially are using the Read example. Read has been very successful in having students influence that and challenge those folk at Read. I wasn't here, I don't know the details, but I do know that students were instrumental in a revision of the Hume curriculum a few years ago. Um, but I also think that's that's a very like that's a way of challenging the status quo of a general structure. But there's also ways to challenge status quo on a much more informal and just like interpersonal level of like when you are working with people, don't necessarily assume what they do or don't know. Don't act like somebody should necessarily know something or should have some particular um, experience. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes it can be hard because you've only ever had your own experiences and you don't know how many of them are broadly shared and how many of them aren't. You don't know how many of them are just because of your culture and how many of them aren't. And so it can be, um, when you're in the moment, it can, it can be really easy to be like, oh my gosh, how do you not know that? And that'll hit some people really differently. Um, then it might be intended. So being aware of those things. Uh, Akash, I think I promised you next. Yeah. Um, what are some of the problems that you and your students encounter in this research? Ah, yeah. Um, do you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> you had to read a lot of papers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I don't want to put you on the hook, you can talk after and then say what you really think. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, me, I worry a lot about the stamina of just like getting through the process um, because it is one of the things that takes, it takes a lot of time. Like if you can, if you can filter 4,000 studies, you can get through anything in research. Like there's never going to be a thing that you can't get through in the end if you have enough time and support to do so. So I, I really think that the sort of like um, emotional level of just um, showing up day after day and doing the same thing for eight weeks to get us to the data source so that you can be able to start doing the work and to be able to um, to sort of like be that deep in the trenches but also maintain this like mile high view of what am I doing this for. And then intrinsic sort of in all qualitative work, I think, especially with this, is, is at, at the end of the day, right, you have pages and pages and pages of narrative. And you're trying to distill this and extract these abstract ideas of what's going on here and how that's similar to other things. And so a lot of times it's just sitting there and being like, I read this paragraph five times and I thought it meant a different thing every, every single time I read it. <laughs> um, and just showing up and keep trying and keep talking with people until it's sort of, you're able to make an argument for how everything is functioning. Yes? Your 5,000 initial articles that boiled down to about three, as I saw in the references on your slides. Yeah, so there's. And what, what level of uh, students are being considered in those three papers? So there's, there's more than three papers. There's, there should be in the references, um, I think at least six. We, thank you for bringing this up. I should have mentioned this earlier. I didn't put the text on the slide, which is um, 
uh, a great way to forget to mention it. But we're still in the process of reading a lot of these papers. Um, we've gone through seven now, I think, total. But of those papers, um, they, they very heavily focus on K-12 um, levels of education. Uh, which is true, our context rates were specifically looking at insights gained from departments of education, uh, and departments of education do tend to have a stronger focus on K-12 education than they do on, on higher ed. So that sort of scales with what we would, I think, expect from the context. Katie, and then over here. Hi. Um, so this is like a really cool description, something I don't know a lot about, right? Like especially the systemic literature view and like kind of in, imposing those parameters. And as we mentioned, um, you, you kind of ended up funneling down to about 29 articles, mm -hmm. heavily focused on K through 12. We've talked about race, we've talked about intersections with other demographics. What like, what types of studies, primary studies, not systematic reviews like this mm -hmm. one, right, would be helpful in moving this field forward? would be helpful in moving this, that we don't yet have that would be helpful. I don't know if we are far enough through the project to answer that question. One thing that I will say is that, I mean, a lot of the, the studies are very theoretical in nature, right? They're theory building. And so having experimental studies of some type is also very powerful, I think, to test the theory. Um, and one of these particular articles that, that came up a couple times in the quotes um, looked at, sort of did a post-mortem of a school that had turned around their test scores and, and greatly reduced equity gaps to look at how exactly that happened. That was a paper that, that really um, made a clear case that we saw sort of echoed less centrally in other theories of why publicly available data was so important in getting that started and that the um, that component of the external accountability to make challenging the status quo less uh, vulnerable. So they talked a lot about the social capital that has to be expended by uh, administrators to get that to work and how having an external uh, requirement to do so allows them to navigate that situation such that they're still pushing this forward, but they're not receiving pushback from their colleagues directly. So I think my, 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 my guess what I would say right now is, is probably more things are pointing towards that, but we might get there when we, when we finish reading the rest of the papers. Um, I think here and then, yes. Actually, that just is a good segue. And then Warren said, your primary or dominant papers were Ford from 2001 to 2003, mm -hmm. uh, Scria 2001. It's been 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I, I, I was, do you know if in any of the more recent papers there are some results or indicators of uh, what works? Yeah, so the, a lot of it, um, frustratingly, in the field, is what works was known then too. And then the question is, how do you get people to do it? Um, and that's, in the, the more recent papers, especially the two that I used at the very beginning, who had, even in their definition, sort of dropped off this racialized aspect, a lot of what they're pointing to is the same type of things, like having dashboards, really examining what your tests are measuring, looking at, in the, in the context of an introductory chemistry class, some introductory chemistry classes, if you look at their exams, most of what they're assessing is, is math skills. And you can sometimes compute an answer without understanding the chemistry behind it. And if your exam is only ever uh, testing math, then you're only ever going to see if students know the math parts. And they're not going to get students who maybe struggle with the math, but should get some credit for their conceptual understanding might not get that credit. So that's, I think, still where a lot of the discussion is, is sort of applying now what we know. I don't know who's first, I'm sorry. Do you think there are, well, I'm going to just assume that there are, but what differences do you think exist in the way that deficit framing and subsequently anti deficit framing manifest in higher education uh, systems compared to K through 12? Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people don't make it to higher education systems because of the, the prevalence of it in K 12. Um, and so sometimes I think um, it can be easier in higher ed for it to take longer for us to change things because we are not, we're dealing with a student body that's already in some way been filtered by that. Um, I don't know if that, well, yes, I'm sure there are other manifestations, but that's the first thing that occurs to me. Uh, I know one of your inclusion aspects to your uh, screening was that the paper needed to be in English. Yeah. 
were the majority of your papers therefore geographically located in both the United States and potentially um, other English-speaking countries? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know where the authors were appointed, but I can check. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it would be interesting to look at this through a view, a lens of um, international school systems mm -hmm. globally, because multicultural competence mm -hmm. is a bit strange, given that most of the teachers are going to be Americans who spend very little time in the cultures that they're instructing within. Um, I wanted to also ask about uh, in reliance on bias, testing scores, a lot of strategies that have been adopted internationally is intense out-of-school cramming, specifically relating to testing for those exam uh, types of tests. Is that a feasible um, like response or solution, or should that also be dismantled when we dismantle the uh, bias testing in general? So if I, uh, <coughs> one thing that I'll, one comment I'll make at the beginning is that uh, a lot of the papers that we talk about like specifically focus on, on unique American cultural aspects and, and how race functions in America is very different from how race functions in some other countries. And so I think it, entirely there's going to be differences there if, you're, if you had a data source to look at those differences. The second part of your question, um, if I understood the, the question correctly, it was this idea of this, this international norm of cramming focused tests, at, is it fair to interpret that as sort of like these, these tests that, that um, are really testing memorization based factual knowledge? Uh, I phrased it wrong. So, for example, with, with the SAT, mm -hmm. students will enter into programs that specifically will teach you culturally how to respond to the SAT. Yeah, so then, then there are very different levels, right, of experiences that the students have there in those environments. They're also going to give you probably diverging outcomes. Um, the SAT is heavily implicated as uh, having biased origins. Um, and so the it would be natural, right, for the SAT, I think, to uh, benefit from um, a re-examination either that's changing the structure of the SAT or, or as you say, dismantling it entirely, some action for sure. Um, the SAT in particular. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. And then I don't, I don't have a sense of the whole room, so I'm just sort of going around this table, but if people can point me in whatever direction I should be going. Uh, yes? Um, so how do you, like, how do you help students who have so greatly, like, been, like, been affected by a deficit, like, framed system? Like, for example, like, I can think of a department at Reed who heavily focuses on my deficit-based system and uses their department to uh, basically weed out students in STEM. And how, like, as a gender minority STEM, I've been told to leave STEM by certain, certain people um, because I shouldn't be in STEM for whatever reason. How do you, like, rebuild students in that way? Well, I think one important thing, right, is to leave students that um, sometimes students will say that, and if you are a person who holds identities where that's never been a way that you've been treated, it sounds unbelievable that that could happen, right? And so there's sometimes this reaction of like, oh, you must have misunderstood or something like that. And I think believing students when they say those things is important, and validating those experiences is important, so I'm sorry that that has happened. Um, the other thing that I think of in a lot, of, I think about this a lot, right, this idea, these things might, it's easy to look at these and say, we should never, we should never try to fix the individual always try to fix the systems, um, but sometimes the systems are so big and they're slow to turn that uh, you're sort of left saying, well, what do I do for the students that are experiencing it now? And so sometimes I think about this in terms of uh, redirecting the boat, but also giving like lifeboats as well, um, of like, you know, this, this is unfair that this is happening in this particular circumstance, the way that I would suggest that you protect yourself or uh, support yourself in the situation is, you know, going to tutoring or these other things that, like, maybe it's possible to restructure a course environment such that you wouldn't need to spend time out of class in tutoring. Um, not that tutoring is bad. Tutoring is very useful. You should take advantage of it when you can. Um, but the... Uh, uh, using those strategies and not just taking them as the solution, giving those strategies because they're the ones that you have now, that can help now, but not letting the existence of those support networks disincentivize you from also fixing the systemic 
and then we shake, and then I think there was a hand over here. Until Arthur cuts me off. Yes. I'm just curious if you know how the shower diamond deficit is anti deficit for any submerged. Was there a lot of observations of these so already in places? Or? Yeah, so from the data source that we have, right, and, and we're definitely missing some of the historical beginnings of this, right? Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of our papers cite a book that's not in our data source because it didn't fit our inclusion criteria. Um, but what we see, right, is a lot of attention to what we would now call equity gaps, um, uh, particularly in, in the context of the K-12 system in terms of which students are selected for gifted and talented programs and which students are selected for special education. Um, and looking at the disparities in those disaggregated in various ways have led to sort of like looking in very much more deeply into how this is happening. Um, and then you'll also, I mean, you'll also get things like this, right, that are just the people who are experiencing it, so they experientially know this is happening, who are raising concerns. Yes? Are there ever situations where the problem is with the individual student? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think there's a question then, right, of sometimes there are particular elements of structures that can fall on in individuals to address, and we've all had the type of, the type of thing where you're like, I know I should have started this before, and there are all these other things that made me not do it. Uh, I don't think, I don't think of an anti-deficit frame as abdicating people from individual responsibility. I think of it much more in terms of making sure that people have access to engaging and performing in the ways that they want. Um, oh dear, I said something that created a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to follow up on, on yeah. Dave's question well, because it seems like it takes both sides. Mm -hmm. And if, if you have a student that wants to succeed in the course, but won't do shit. Mm -hmm. How do you fix that? Yeah, so uh, I think I think the question the anti deficit frame would just would just automatically assume, right, that the student it's the student's fault that they're not doing it. And I think an anti deficit frame in some ways just says, let's put the brakes on on making an assumption before we find out more information um, about what the student is doing. Is the student have all the time in the world and they just don't want to do it, or is the student working a lot? Has the student frequently been in classes where they have been de disincentivized from engaging, where they've been put in a situation to choose between their identity and what success looks like? Are there these structural factors that are um, influencing their actions, or is it coming from something else? I think like basically just um, not necessarily making assumptions about intent from the get-go is a big component of it. Soon they have a lot of time, but and this is great that I was to said earlier, if they have something like ADHD, mm -hmm. all the time in the world doesn't necessarily matter. Right. So you have to be well, beyond just simple how much time they have yes. versus how much effort or what have you. A lot of people say ADHD, but I'm going to have some effort into their work. Right. Yeah. Sure. Can you, can you say a little bit more about, in your opinion, part of the deficit? Yes, so for example, when you start to select students to be uh, added to a gifted and talented program versus the others, say at the age of first grade or second grade, you're already assuming that the students who did not get to be part of the gifted and talented program do not deserve to be there. So aren't you already inculcating the feeling of imposter syndrome that we often talk about, that students just start to believe that they don't belong in that program? And I know that there are a lot of factors, for example, how much money does a school district have? How much can they focus on students who are not part of the talented and gifted programs? But there is a difference in their schooling experience and the way they um, engage with the material or the way the material is presented to them between the two different. So part of... Could you rephrase the question to some extent? I'm not sure that I'll do the question justice, but the idea was sort of, isn't the, the general existence of a gifted and talented program adopting a deficit orientation? Absolutely. Um, 
And I will say that in the in the in, in the introduction background of some of our papers, they talk about um, the literature. I don't know a lot about the, the intricacies of gifted and talented programs themselves, but those papers do cite that there are some reasons to believe historically that a lot of what they did was function to resegregate schools, which I would say would echo a lot of the deficits we we've discussed. Yes, Veronica. I, I have a question about future work in your area and whether you have plans to um, possibly make suggestions specifically addressing um, testing and assignments and how to frame those in an anti-deficit framework. Yeah, I think for the, for the scope of this study, um, to be completely honest, maybe more honest than I should be since this is being recorded, um, a lot of this came, a lot of the idea for this study came from the idea that, that these terms aren't very well talked about in STEM education or in chemistry education research. And so the people who have done a little bit of reading in this area spend a lot of time explaining these every single time they want to use the terms. And they're very useful terms to be able to use a lot of times, especially when you generalize them and then you can say like, you know, this is the structure uh, operating that the instructors are in, why we can and can't do something from the, in the constraints that I have on my classes. Um, and, and I was, you know, it's just very time intensive to have to explain it every single time. So I was like, I would like a publication to send to you instead. Um, and so that really guided our research questions that sort of set the boundaries, I think, of this particular publication in, in being in terms of just saying this is what this thing is. Um, and then I think part of the goal is raising awareness and that will then incentivize some of the things to try to say, like, following this logic, what recommendations would we make and how much do they work? Yes. Veronica, again, and then I'll say. I just have another quick question. Like, have you thought about um, forming maybe a semi local committee or group to sort of maybe start implementing some actual changes in the curriculum and a variety of areas to address these issues? You mean in my local environment? Yes. Yeah, so I have been here a year and a half, um, and so that sounds politically dangerous, but also, uh, but also I do, I mean, one of the things that I really love about my job is that I think that I'm surrounded by colleagues who, who know these things and really care deeply about these things and have made steps before I got here to try to uh, embrace more um, evidence-based pedagogies that try to make a lot of these things directly into the core structures. So I think my local environment was headed that way with or without me, and I'm happy to be on that ship. I was thinking like Pacific Northwest. Ah, I, I'm gonna focus like on the joint. <laughs> <laughs> we can partner together in this effort. <laughs> uh, Alice. Yeah, um, so I had a question about like the authors. Did the race of the authors change uh, throughout this time of study? Because you talked about how early authorship focused more on racism, whereas later authorship uh, avoided the topic of race. And so I was wondering if that is an influence of like a, we live in the post-racist world, post-Obama, or if like the number of people who were writing these papers might have skewed more white and therefore didn't want to dive into the issue of race. I don't know the identities of the authors unless they share them in the text. So uh, I, I mentioned that some of the authors are, are, are people of color, and that's because uh, sometimes they, they bring in their own experiences and then they mention their own identities in that context. But other than that, I don't know for sure. Fair enough. But it's a good question. Um, yes. Did you get into this concept that is used in K-12 of NGSS? I'm familiar with NGSS, but it hasn't come up in this data set yet. Um, would you explain what NGSS stands for? New Generation Science Standards. It was primarily <laughs> by white people. Mm -hmm. I am not super familiar with the K-12 education. What I know about NGSS is that it was a restructuring of the curriculum, and I don't know a lot of the implications of what grow or how that restructuring focused. But I think it's a good question, especially for the K-12 realm, and also, as mentioned before, for the higher ed book realm, since we receive students from the K-12 realm. Yes? I have a follow-up question to that. Yeah. Would it be methodologically or perhaps ethically wrong 
offers identities in city schemes and then like an observation of that potential sort of reflexivity that you kind of talked about earlier in the presentation? Yeah, so is the first part of your question, if I understand it correctly, is is it methodologically or ethically wrong to, to try to collect the information about the author's identities? I think ethically, but not inherently. Um, methodologically, speaking in the context of this study, one of the things that um, uh, that becomes very important in a lot of these studies is like you start with research questions, and then everything has to tie back to the research questions. Um, and so we don't have a, a clear mandate in the research questions that have guided our study up to this point to do that, but like follow-up studies, I think, could ask research questions where that would be relevant and then a reasonable thing to do, and then an IRB will tell you if it's ethical or not. <laughs> Other questions? I think I'm going to step in and thank Nicole for fielding probably the most intense question of <laughs> answer.